My name is Craig Pickett. I'm an executive recruiter. More than a decade ago, I started my practice for one purpose, to use my experience as a former military aviator, business jet sales executive, and P&L leader to help aviation and aerospace companies and their executives be fast, adaptable, and strategic. I do these podcasts to inspire and inform, but more importantly, they are a focused platform to help business leaders grow. Welcome to the Aerospace Executive Podcast. Welcome back to the Aerospace Executive Podcast. I am uh, thrilled to have Vince Scott with me. Vince is the, uh, the president of the uh, Defense Cybersecurity Group up in uh, the DC area. He's a, an ex-Naval officer and uh, cryptologist. He's worked with uh, some agencies we won't talk about and is an expert in the cyber arena. And I came across something that you wrote, Vince, and it was the problem with cybersecurity, the truth you don't want to know. And I'm already, I'm already scared. So, so welcome and, and uh, thanks for coming on. Let's, uh, let's Thanks, Craig. Back. Thanks, Craig. It's great to be here. Um, I really enjoy the opportunity to talk about cyber, uh, particularly to, to executives, right? I think they have such an impact on it and it's, it's an area that's not, not often well understood. You're right, I did blog not that long ago about cybersecurity and the biggest problem in cybersecurity being the truth you don't want to know. And I, I, I think that message uh, ought to go out to every executive. Um, in, in my experience, and I've been retired from the Navy about 10 years, I like to say I, I used to play offense and now I coach defense. Um, I have uh, spent a lot of time in the commercial space. Uh, so I'm, I'm focused on Department of Defense contractors now, helping them prepare for the new cybersecurity standards from the DOD. But really over the last 10 years, I've spent a lot of time in Fortune 500. Um, and I have repeatedly seen this problem where we don't want to know that it's not good. So, so the most common problem I see in companies in, as it relates to this is we have purchased a security stack. We're talking to the board of directors and the CEO. They're asking questions about cyber now. And they're coming across and saying, hey, what are we doing about this? And, and the answer is, well, boss, we've got DLP. We've got data loss prevention. That's this great new technical system. And we're going we're gonna to solve the world's problem because we've got DLP. And then I would do things like go into these companies as a consultant and they would say, well, help us with this, blah, blah, blah. We want to be better. Okay, let's talk about your DLP. How's that set up? Well, you know, it's running and it's good and we're good. Okay, well, where are the alerts from that going? Oh, well, they're, they're going to a, a file. Uh, yeah, who looks at that file? Well, Fred's supposed to look at that file, but Fred left the company three months ago and nobody really looks at that file, right? So, so how much risk reduction are you getting if you tell the board of directors and the CEO, I've got DLP and they go, they feel better because I, I am preventing data loss from my company. I have this thing that's out there scanning and making sure that my intellectual property and my important information is not going anywhere. I have literally walked into a Fortune 50 company where DLP is configured to look for cuss words. That's the only thing it looks for. It dumps its results into a file that nobody looks at, at a Fortune 50 company. That's ridiculous. And then we talk so, about IP theft. We talk about IP theft yeah. and all that. It's like, you know, we, we and, see the and, enemy. and a lot of times when I push on why this is, there's a kid out there in that company that knows this is a problem. You don't need a $500 an hour consultant to come in and tell you this ain't right. <laughs> There's somebody in your organization that knows. And a lot of times what I get buzz, well, but there's no more manpower that's going to come my way in order to look at those alerts. I've got all these other things that my boss is asking me about. Nobody asked me about this, so I don't do it, right? Um, it, it, that is a classic problem with a security stack where we don't want to turn the volume up on that so we can hear the bad stuff that's going on in our organization, because who would deal with that? Oh, well, turn the volume down to zero, tell the board we've got this security stuff, and hope nothing goes wrong. That that That's very standard. I would argue that the majority of the security stack and across the Fortune 1000 in the United States is optimized to 5%. 
95 percent of its capability is left on the table well you know look i think it, and you tell me if i'm wrong i was talking to a guy the other day and he was great he's great executive he said look the backbone of every company is its it infrastructure and this is a cfo this is a finance yep. guy he goes the backbone of every company is its it infrastructure very forward thinking guy. Too many people look at IT, cyber, it's a cost. I got to have my computers, I got to have servers. Yep. They don't see any, you know, you got to upgrade your IT. Oh my God, how much is that going to cost me? Well, what's it going to cost you if you don't, right? Am I, am I wrong when I no, well, and the, the change that we've seen over the course of our careers, right, we talked a little bit about entering the Navy around the same time in the, the mid to late 80s. Um, when I went to my first ship, right, I bought brought the first laptop ever to that ship. It had no network. We did. I had a clipboard with things I wrote in stubby pencil, right? Yeah. And so we, we did things that way in the past. And right. if I wanted to change a business process, we just changed it. Tell me today how you change a business process without IT. You, you, you cannot do it. There, there, there may be, I, I grew up in dry cleaning. My, my stepfather ran one of the biggest dry cleaning businesses in St. Louis. He refused to do anything computer and we were still using paper tickets and stapling things onto garments and all that stuff. Zero computers in a cash register that just did a tape, right? Maybe in that company, they can make change a process without changing IT, but for, 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 Every company out there today, your IT governs how you can do business processes, whether that's marketing, whether that's sales, whether that's operation, whether that's inventory control, doesn't matter. Every business process now requires IT. And if you want to have a flexible, agile, responsive company, then you better have IT that's prepared to deal with that. Client of mine got hacked by the Russians. His CFO talked him into buying insurance. You know, he's like, hey, 1800 bucks, I'll buy insurance. The insurance saved him a million, a million in Bitcoin to get, you know, ransomware. That's it. You know, a million in Bitcoin to unlock his computers. And he needed it. Otherwise, he's dead. Otherwise, he's dead in the water. You're a Fortune 50, yep. co you're a Fortune 50 company. You know, the aviation executive podcast. What happens if you're a supplier to Lockheed Martin or Boeing or whatever else and ransomware comes in, they lock you down, they shut you down. How much? How much do they want Bitcoin to? And have they got your data already, right? We're already starting to make moves now to say, no, really, your data is compromised if you get ransomware. I, I, I consider ransomware to be my friend because certainly those are the types of cyber attacks that get noticed. There is no problem detecting ransomware because it is there in your face. The other 90% of cyber hacks that go on are people who don't want you to know that they're there. So, and to me, yeah, that is much scarier. I have actually seen a hacker patch a system and update its antivirus, the hacker, and so nobody else can get on the box. I have seen that happen. <laughs> Right. He doesn't want anything to go wrong with this box because he's real happy in here. Man, I'm getting some good stuff off this box. Right. That is that those are the one. Honestly, I think that makes up the majority of the problem. Uh, the majority of the real cyber risk that's out there for companies isn't ransomware. The majority of the cyber risk is I lost my intellectual property. Right. The there's a Chinese company that's going to beat me to market because they just stole my stuff, paid nothing for it and turned it out. They stole my software that I've been spending the last two years in two million dollars development. Yep. So th that I, I, I think it, and we don't evaluate that risk. Well, uh, again, that's back to the truth. We don't want to know. A lot of times I've seen companies I, I went. I, so I did work for PwC, one of the big four consultants mm -hmm. for a while. I went into a Fortune 500 company. Um, and they, um, they challenged me like on Monday, they were like, yeah, show us when we've ever been hacked. And I was like, okay, uh, Hey, give me some access to your, you know, like your firewall logs. And I want to review some stuff and blah, blah, blah. So on Friday afternoon, <laughs> usually when the consultants are flying home, I was challenged, right? I went through the logs and I said, well, what about these last six, these six places that happened in the last week? 
and they lost their minds. That was not the truth they wanted to know. <laughs> no, 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 you don't understand. <laughs> no, I understand. You said, show me where I've been at. I just showed you. That's what you, 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 you said, yeah, show me. Okay. I'm from Missouri. Here you go. Um, and they really didn't want to know. They wanted to keep doing what they were doing because that was their budget. Um, I do think that's part of the problem is we don't really have security in IT. Normally there's not, IT is getting beat up, lower your budget, lower your budget, lower your budget, your overhead. So when a security challenge comes up, the CIO is telling the CISO, you're not getting any more budget. There, there's, there's no money to solve a problem that you identify. So the, the, the unspoken message is, don't don't give me new problems, right? Don't don't identify a problem because I'm not going to spend any money to fit it, fix it. One of the things I do recommend, and I think executives should really think about this, if you have your cybersecurity organization aligned to your CIO, I think there's a conflict of interest there. I think you really ought to think about breaking that out. I didn't used to be that way when I left the military and kind of started down this road. I was very much in the CISO should work for the CIO. Uh, over time, I've come to the conclusion that it's a bad plan for that exact reason. It, it, you need that CISO to have some independence from mm -hmm. IT to be able to say, no, that's not working. Or here's a problem and we need to fix it. And let's get together with the CIO. But if the CISO works for the CIO, you, that never flows up to the, the executive suite. You never hear that story. So yeah. I, I think that's something to really look at. It's, it's amazing because it scares the hell out of me. Like you know, Dow Chemical, you know, titanium dioxide. And people go, titanium dioxide, what's that? Well, it's what makes paint the purest form of white. And Dow had intellectual property that had the best titanium dioxide. They got hacked by China. And now a competitor is out there selling you know, titanium. Purest Better white. Form of, pure, purest form of white paint that you can that you can get and it's a big business um because they allowed somebody into the you know, somebody snuck in and i'm trying to think of the other what was the other one i read recently um that's a wind, great example wind farms wind farms i've seen that one you saw that you know the, you know people out of the, all across europe people you know company from once again china putting up wind farms with stolen ge yep ip the turbine, yep. the, the, the turbine and the transmission. The software that runs that and the turbine and stuff. And uh, actually, I saw where that yep. one was discovered by a uh, company was trying to work demonstrations of software. And they found out that their Chinese yep. uh, client already had the, the yep. unlock software and they were already using it. Yep. Uh, potentially $2 billion of business lost. Oh, put one cut, put the company out of business. I mean, like not just yeah. two billion and lost it. Put this one company like Gonzo you're, uh, under. You're, you're, yeah, see it. you're done. You're done. So I yep. mean, people think, ah, how real is it? But you know, it's kind of like you know, you know, you could sit there and say the CIO. You know, I guess I'm preaching now, but yeah, you, know, you got your CIO, you got your CISO, but it's kind of like in the Navy where you, know, you get, yeah, it's their job, but everybody's job is to fight a fire. And yes. I think every, everybody in the company, it's their job to protect the company from malware. You know, what are you downloading? What are you, you know, what, what are you opening up on your email? Um, you know, it's, and, and it's, I think it's, maybe it's getting easier with the new generation who's more used to, you know, you know my kids are, you know, 10 times more computer literate than I'll ever hope to be. And they're, they're digital natives and we are just immigrants. <laughs> maybe they're thinking, maybe they're thinking about it now, but, but at the end of the day, you know, you go, all right, how do you teach everybody in your company that IT is everybody's responsibility or do you? Yeah. Yeah. No, I think you, I think you need to, I think you, uh, back to the Navy examples, right? Uh, I've thought about writing a blog that says everything that I needed to know about cybersecurity I learned as a DCA. So for, for those people who don't know or have the, the, the Navy background, that's the damage control assistant. This is a, a position created sort of towards the end of the Second World War to combat the kamikaze threat. And, and so many Navy ships were getting damaged. They created a person whose job it was to coordinate 
the actual crisis response, but also then being tra- and, uh, required to train the entire ship's crew and make sure everybody learned and got qualified mm-hmm. to do damage control, right? right? And I so I do think that's something that as cybersecurity professionals, we, we do have to take on that evangelist uh, mindset and we do have to get out there and we do have to train people. Mm-hmm. Um, but they, we, we also have to realize there's a limit uh, to to what that training will do, and humans are going to make mistakes, and then you've got to be prepared to catch that and deal with it. Um, I still think that the the least appreciated, and this goes back to my conversation about ransomware uh, attribute of cyber, is actually detection. So, and, and that it fits in that you truth you don't want to know. If you don't want to know the truth, you don't want to detect bad things inside your network, right? But if you if you have a strong detection capability mm-hmm. and you can deal with things and we talk about dealing with them in seconds and oh two minutes this and blah 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 solar winds last for nine months right kick them out in three days don't mm-hmm. let them measure you for the sunday punch and that takes time that's mm-hmm. still not automated there's a mm-hmm. person on the other end of that wire somewhere who's working at person speeds trying to figure out your network how to hurt you the worst where your intellectual property is where does where is super white paint formula stored right mm-hmm. and that takes time and that takes a human being to do that so if you have a detection process that's dealing with these things and shutting these doors and you see unusual activity and you and you shut it down, I think that does a lot to mitigate your risk for for those serious, mm-hmm. boy, I'm going to steal your the the crown jewels of your organization because it takes time to do that. Yeah, let's 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 flip it a different let's go a different direction. So I'm just assuming as I look at my computer, which I just had built a year ago, and I'm on Microsoft 365. I use you know, Office 365, and now everybody else is on AWS or Azure or the cloud. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the other, the cloud. The cloud. I gotta assume now, like, look, you know, everybody and their dog is trying to hack the cloud. Um, your information's, uh, yeah. Now Microsoft is protecting your information, and I gotta think now. So, all right. So, how scary is that? And then the second thing is obviously the new buzzword is AI, um, machine learning. How far does machine learning go to you know, provide a level of system protection or does it? Yeah. So, well, or what happens if it's on the offensive side of the ball? Oh, okay. <laughs> right? Stuxnet, but, but, Stuxnet, right? We created, we started it. So. I, I disagree completely, right? There's a whole movie out there about Stuxnet right. that must have 50 photos of exploding nuclear weapons in it. Right. And, and the entire theme of the movie is we've opened Pandora's box. Nah, yes. That was out there, there were already. Physical attacks going on in cyberspace years before that happened. The the premise that this was invented yeah. uh, you know, by the United States and we've somehow done this horrible thing is uh just ill-founded it's just not true yeah the the the, but let me take your questions in order so step back a little bit on cloud what what worries me about that so i i I think there's goodness and badness in the cloud uh the goodness is and you mentioned it google is spending billions on security microsoft is spending billions on security right and so if you're a, a reasonably sized company or a small company you're gonna get way more security from them than you can afford Right. Right. So so there's a certain amount of that taking this off prem, putting it in the cloud actually raises the bar from a security perspective for you, because there there are inherent security controls behind that more than you're going to see in the the laptop that you bought uh, from Amazon. And now you you popped it it, in your home Wi-Fi and you're 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 off to the races. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think there's some goodness in that, that, that we are seeing a shift. Hackers are shifting from this. I want to get to your endpoint, you know, and exploit the stuff that's on your box to I want to exploit your cloud, your mm-hmm. AWS bucket, right? And and that is absolutely already occurred. We already see advanced persistent threat, nation states kind of guys and others out there really focusing on the cloud more and more because that's where we're putting our data. Mm-hmm. Um, the key to cloud is similar to the key to your on-prem though in that y- are you configured well? Right. And, and that takes technical knowledge and expertise. Uh, it takes pe- somebody following up on it. 
Um, in some ways, cloud's been the wild, wild west. Hey, we've got all these, particularly at aerospace companies or larger companies, right, that have been around for a while. They have a lot of rules now around IT. They have process. They have bureaucracy, right? And so uh, business units have gone, man, I can do this in AWS and get away from those IT guys. And woohoo! It's, it's, it's open season. Uh, and we don't need to worry about that security stuff, which results in all that sensitive data now plopped out there in the cloud online for anybody who wants to come along and scan it to be able to pull it down, right? Ooh, that's not what we meant to happen. And uh, so I think it's the, the, the same in the cloud that you have to have people who understand how to configure that in ways that's not going to expose that to everybody on the internet. Mm -hmm. uh, and and giving those people, you know, the, the opportunity to actually to secure your environment the way it needs to be, whether that's in the cloud or on-prem. On the AI ML side, um, I think AI is more aspirational than it is real. Uh, we've, we've talked about it, uh, you know, at the Naval Academy, I had a, 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 a professor who was like, AI is gonna be here tomorrow in 1987. Uh, we're still not really there. Yeah. Um, it's more ML machine learning stuff. Um, I think there are advantages to offense and defense in that space. And you're starting to see tools that take advantage of that in both the offensive and defensive space um, in learning what should be normal in your environment, how to recognize what's not normal. That's a key part of the security space. Uh, ML uh, has a lot of uh, potential opportunity there to help people. But what I would argue is Really, this is the special forces truths, number one. People are more important than hardware. People are more important than hardware. People are more important than hardware. So we, we tend to think about cyber as a technical problem. And I would much rather have three or four of the best people and no hardware budget, no software budget, I'll download free tools and get my four smart people to configure them and use them in my security defensive operation. Way rather have that than have the most expensive tools in the world and not have the people to run them. Interesting. So it really is. I mean, it's a human issue. It all comes it, down to absolutely. You, your, your strength is your people. And once people, again, yeah. You get at, anybody, at, when people come into your company, I mean, your companies need to set up a protocol. For every employee that comes into the company, I mean, you give them a desk, you give them a computer, a cubicle, whatever, and you don't say anything to them, like use your common sense. You don't say anything to them. I mean, do companies need to start to set up a, a training program? The, this is the yeah. guidelines. You know, I don't want to say training program, it's but. Uh, training program. Yeah. Training. No, you have to take your, and, and I live in the Department of Defense space now, so this is a requirement. You don't get on to a government computer anymore without your cybersecurity training, one hour training course. You, you can't do it. So as DOD contractors, we we definitely follow that same model, which is you need to, you need to have your training course. I think that's even in Fortune 500, I'm starting to see that more and more though, where here's your employee handbook, your employee handbook, you have to sign and turn back. It has your, we do the right thing here. You know, we don't take bribes and sort of that sort of stuff. And now increasingly those have got a cyber section. Here's what um, authorized use or acceptable use is for our IT equipment. Don't do things you're not supposed to. And here's kind of what that list is. And oh, by the way, we're going to be monitoring you. We're going to require you to do training. We're going to blah, blah, blah. So that that's growing. Oh, you just brought up a good point. How many people out there are really getting monitored on their computers? In Fortune 500, it's something I want people All of to them. know. So All of them. People I, want, I want them to know that. You know, when you're on yep. your company's computer. Yep, you, you know, consent to monitor. I, almost, I, I don't know that I've been at any Fortune 500 company mm -hmm. in the last 10 years that did not have a click here for consent to monitoring as you log into your computer. Yeah. Um, and, and even down chain from that, um, any company of any size that has sort of a security IT space, they are collecting information on where you're going on the internet, in some cases, what you're doing on the internet. Now, whether or not they're looking at that and using that data and how it's, you know, how accessible it is and all that varies greatly. Uh, but 
but certainly in companies of any size, that absolutely is being monitored. I mean, you know, you think about financial, you know, the financial services companies, the banks, it's oh my God, they do yes. it for they do it for, for SEC compliance. They, they yeah. say, look, you know, you it's it's absolutely essential. But yeah, you, know, you think about the person, you know, you know, you know Joe and or, you know, Joe and Jane and XYZ Fortune Fortune one hundred company, yeah, you know, it's like, hey, look, yes, people are you know, they, they yeah. see where you're, they may not be looking every day and they may not really care about the innocuous emails, but it's all there. It's all, you know, so right. Yeah, no, that is absolutely right. And, uh, you know, different companies have different levels of that and different accessibility, but everybody is being monitored in some fashion on their work computer. Yeah. Interesting. So, so what, is, so ultimately, where does this all go? I mean, you think about you know, the, the great, you know, you, you see North Korea hacking people for billions of dollars to get money for the DOD huh? programs. That money's coming from somewhere. You know, where does this all go if, 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 you know, defense is the thing that's missing, you know, what's the reality check companies, what does a CEO need to have to hear before he gets serious about his or her IT? Yeah, I, I mean, generally where I've seen CEOs get serious is when they've had a, a bad uh, experience where, uh, generally, the FBI, sometimes DHS, occasionally another three-letter agency knocks on their door and says, uh, you got a problem, <laughs> right? That's usually where CEOs really get religion on this. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, that, that's kind of late in the game. And, and the truth is, as we look at evaluating this risk as CEOs across the board, uh, you don't hear those stories. Yeah. The, the, there's no requirement to publish that in most cases, right? The notification requirement is for a breach of personally identifying information. There's all that intellectual property breach stuff. There's no requirement for that to be reported. Now, it, under SEC rules, if it's a material issue, you could get into SEC filings potentially on that. But I would argue a lot of companies, that's very relatively new. Um, a lot of companies hadn't been doing that in the past. So that's just not uh, a place where we're getting a, a breadth of information about what's really gone, going on out there. So I believe that's happening a lot more and, and its impact is greater than we know or that CEOs know because uh, CEOs that have it happen to them general, generally tend to not talk about that, right? Well, Purchase well, stock price. But once again, anytime anybody, any, anytime somebody with an FBI windbreaker shows up your door, one, it's not good. And, and I can't think of any CEO no. who wants to go to the board and say, gee, I got great news. I'm pleased to tell you we got hacked and it just cost us. So, yeah. you, you know, Truth we don't want to know. And and that's because it could be an expensive truth. I, so so yeah. I think they'll look at this through the risk lens and say, understand that how how high those risks are for you as a CEO. Increasingly, CEOs are being held personally accountable for this. Mm -hmm. um, and you need to ask hard questions. And I know there's a move to have uh, more cyber smart people on boards who can be asking tough questions and even going so far as to commit, create a committee uh, off your board, you know, like your audit committee that looks at cyber and has two or three members of your board who, who really deep dive that. I think those are all good moves for companies. Um, you know, and the biggest thing for CEOs today, uh, you know, you've got a, a, a bunch of folks standing in your office going, it's all green, boss. Um, I, I, I would always be skeptical uh, <laughs> and always be asking hard questions in that space uh, because uh, you can turn around and, and find that you have an enormously uh, under-realized risk uh, because you just didn't have that information and it didn't float up to you. So, so really digging on that, really having your internal audit digging on that, having some expertise to dig on that. Unfortunately, a lot of times in auditing, I see you have a kid fresh from school who's a CPA at a big four auditing firm asking a kid fresh from school who's a CPA in the finance department, hey, are you doing this IT thing right? And neither one of them really understands what it is. So they would go, oh, it must be good. <laughs> that, that is not a plan for success. So, uh, you know, how do you buff your internal audit organization with the right kinds of cyber folks too? So let's put a people aspect on it. You know, let's, let's go to the people aspect on it. 
where where you know, where are you finding these people who yeah you know it's a tough world out there right now and it's and and, and skill sets are hard to find where are you finding these people that are going to do this for you i mean every it's it's something you got to go find a computer expert i don't care what company you are every, you got to find a computer expert and you're not going to go find it at best buy at the geek squad the geek squad um you don't always need a computer expert okay. sometimes you do okay. um leadership is the technical skill always in shorter supply mm -hmm. um i think that um you know when you have hard problems do you have the right leader and sometimes the real, real technical guy isn't the right leader. Um, if you're going, I think transitioning military is a great place uh, to find willingness in this space, right? Now, they may not have 50 certifications, and that tends to be the bar to HR. You know, the entry, you know they put 12 certifications on your, your, oh, hell, I need a person with this certification, this certification, and this certification. Mm -hmm. Certifications are only valuable for getting through the HR front door. In general, they don't, I, I don't feel like they, they greatly enhance your technical capabilities. I've got a number on my resume. I tend to not put them out there very much, very occasionally, uh, because I wasn't really impressed with any of those tests that I took. Um, uh, and so I think, uh, you know, that, uh, one of the things you had posted to your LinkedIn where you were talking about that that willingness, that attitude being more important than the technical skill, because if you've got that hire for attitude and then grow the technical skill, mm -hmm. I think that's a good move. And I think you can do that in the cyberspace. Um, and there's you know a lot of transitioning military or kids or other folks out there going, how do I get into security? And I can't get hired because I don't have 12 certifications and five years experience. There's some great smart kids out there. And you know what else? This space, particularly at the technical level, changes so fast. Because right. I was doing this 30 years ago doesn't mean anything. Mm -hmm. It may, may not mean anything that I did this five years ago. Right. So so the, the delta between a new kid and, and somebody who's got 15 years of experience may not be as much as you think. M minus that leadership piece, right? So so I think you need to leaven your smart technical kids with some 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 leaders who really know understand how to lead and how to make things happen yep. but i think there's talent out there hire mm -hmm. for that willingness to learn mm -hmm. get some of those smart young kids in there and uh you know in in two years with the right attitude they'll be great they'll be doing yeah, everything well, you need well, them to do well i think about who's the kid that was who's the nsa kid yeah, uh, oh snowden uh, snowden yeah he didn't have a college degree how many people would well you yeah it's, snowden was a failed help desk person who now uh, yeah. you know, puts himself out there as an expert in national security agency operations. He didn't know anything. <laughs> he was a help desk dude and he just scraped off a bunch of PowerPoint slides and read them only half of which he really understood. Anyway. <laughs> All right. No, I look, I watched, my wife and I watched that movie a couple of weeks ago. We were like, this is really boring. You know, Facebook, you know, he's talking about the, you know, the, the, the CIA or the NSA, all the information they're getting. I'm like, you know, Hey, they're, they're not doing anything Facebook's not doing. So it, it was kind of, <laughs> you know, was, <laughs> if you want to know something about somebody, just go to go call Facebook. But uh, yeah. I, I or Google or some of these Google. data companies out there. There's data companies you've never heard of that have, we, we worry about the federal government creating a dossier on us by person. Talk right. to a marketing guy, talk no to a marketing data person, man, they have got you, you have your own unique marketing ID associated with you and and they have built a profile of you that absolutely skunks anything the federal government is oh going. my gosh it's it, and, and like me you know I, i'm on yeah I'm, I'm on linkedin i don't do facebook but you know, yeah I'm me either LinkedIn. i'm, I'm, I'm a linkedin, LinkedIn guy i'm on yeah. linkedin but i put a blog out there i got my feet you know, like those guys know more about me than my mother knows about me and uh it's 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 a scary world but um it's it's interesting so no, I love, you know, I love the fact that you came on and you're like, hey, look, it's, you know, when you talk about the cyber world, it comes down to people. Like most things, it comes down to yep. the people and the leadership and, um, yeah, the focus. I'm a, I'm a huge believer in that. I think that's a great takeaway for your your audience of executives. Um, we often think about cyber through the technical lens, right? And, and really, this is as much of a people problem as anything else. I, I think it's a lot of leaders going 
you know, look, I don't understand this. I'll find somebody who does understand it. We'll hire them. We'll let them build a team of people who understand it and then hold them, you know, give them accountable. responsibility and hold them accountable yep. for the results. And I think that's a good, you know, like any good company, it's like, hey, look, it's, you know, you may not like to spend the money on it, but you're going to have to. It's real. Make it, it, is, it is definitely real. So all good. How do people get a hold of you? Yeah, so www.cybersecguru.com or Vincent Scott on LinkedIn. Uh, you can find me there. Uh, my company, Defense Cybersecurity Group, we're really focused on helping uh, Department of Defense companies. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a brand new compliance requirement out there. Anybody who sells through to the Department of Defense, uh, you absolutely have to be aware of the new uh, Defense Federal Acquisition Regulation rules that, that hit 30 November. Uh, there's some new requirements that we hadn't seen before. Uh, to, to tell the DOD how you're doing against cyber. Uh, that, that's a brand new requirement that hit 30 November. And then we've got the, the cybersecurity maturity model certification. Yet, yet another you know, uh, certification you're gonna have to get as a company uh, to do business with the DOD. And everybody uh, down to the lowest tiered subcontractor is going to have to have one of those certifications. So what the, the DOD CISO has said, uh, Katie Arrington, is that if you mow the lawn at a DOD facility, you're going to need to have this. So if you're manufacturing vanes for a jet engine that's going to go in through, you know, uh, a couple of layers to uh, the F-35, you're going to have to have one of these certifications. So it's really important to understand that. Um, I think uh, the aviation world's got a great model and some of the aviation safety stuff and the, the trackability and traceability of that. And I know we all love that uh, from, a, from an aviation perspective, right? But uh, a significant burden there to track all those parts and how that all works and be able to move, do that. I think from a cyber perspective, um, this new standard uh, that actually has been placed for about five years uh, for the most part, uh, really now it's just about accountability for your doing what the DOD has been saying all along. And uh, that's going to be a heavy lift for a lot of companies. So get ahead of it uh, and get people, you know, uh, expertise, my company, somebody's company uh, to help you understand those requirements and really uh, start that journey. Uh, a year isn't too long. Two years is not too long to think about phasing in your ability to be ready for that th independent third-party assessment. Yeah, I, I tell you, you know, I, I talked to aerospace companies in green, you know, the environmental is, you know, like you might as well get used to it because it's not going away. And it's like you say on the cyber issues. Yep, get used not going to, away. Get used to them because they're not going away. Um, yep. it's, it's a new, it's a new world. Hey Vince, thanks for coming on today. I really enjoyed the conversation and you will come back because uh, I could talk about this stuff for hours, to be honest with you. Absolutely. Yeah. Happy to come back, Craig. It's always great to uh, talk to another Navy guy. Uh, really appreciate the opportunity to be on your, on your show. Vince Scott, president defense cybersecurity group. And uh, thanks for coming on. Thank you, sir. I hope you enjoyed the latest edition of the aerospace executive podcast. You can reach out to me directly, Craig and NorthstarESG.com or check us out at www.northstaresg.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Podbean, or on YouTube. Just do a search for Aerospace Executive Podcast. Thanks again. I'm Craig Pippen.